We should do so quickly and quietly. Final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 12957 in the name of Dr Nanette Milne on Marie Curie's changing the conversation on terminal illness report. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. Um, I'd also further invite members who are leaving the chambers to do so quickly and quietly. Dr Milne, seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Deciding Officer. I very much welcome the opportunity to discuss palliative and end-of-life care, and I particularly welcome Marie Curie's latest report on changing the conversation on terminal illness, together with the important research on access to palliative care carried out on behalf of the charity by the London School of Economics. I'm also grateful to colleagues across the political divide who have enabled this debate to take place. Defined as the active, holistic care of people with advanced progressive illness involving the management of pain and other symptoms and the provision of psychological, social and spiritual support, clearly palliative care would be of benefit to very many people as they approach the end of their lives, not just to those with terminal cancer, which is the condition most commonly diagnosed in those who actually receive this form of care. But many people in the UK today who would derive benefit from palliative care are either not offered it or receive it for only a very short time before they die. The current fa facts are stark and clearly indicate why positive action needs to be taken to support people living with a terminal illness and their families if they are to be sure of getting the care they need as their condition progresses. Of the 54,000 people who die in Scotland each year, it's estimated that between 35 and 40,000 should have some palliative care. But the LSE study for Marie Curie found that nearly 11,000 who need it are not in fact receiving it. And only one in five people with a non-cancer diagnosis are identified for palliative care. With carers across the UK claiming that seven out of every 10 people with a terminal illness do not get all the care and support they need. And even a quarter of cancer patients are not receiving palliative care. Specific groups of people less likely to be considered for palliative care are those aged over 85, those who live alone, those from black, Asian and minority ethnic communities and those who live in areas of deprivation. This is simply not good enough and indicates significant in inequity of provision today, a problem which will undoubtedly get worse as our population ages unless action is taken urgently to address the situation. At present, a third of the patients in Scottish hospitals are in their last year of life, and half of Scotland's deaths occur in hospital, even though most people's preference is to die at home or in a homely setting. So we're already well short of providing the end-of-life care which most people seek. And given the predicted 13% increase in deaths over the next 25 years, and the fact that many of us who live well into advanced old age will have multiple and complex health problems, such as dementia, heart failure, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or the complications of diabetes or long-term obesity, there is a clear and <coughs> urgent need for the conversation about terminal care, which is being recommended by Marie Curie. We should acknowledge that people with all types of terminal disease, and not just cancer, can benefit from palliative care, and this ideally should be planned for from the point of diagnosis of the terminal nature of the illness, so that an appropriate care pathway is in place as the condition progresses. And this care can be delivered within the community, in a hospice, or when necessary in hospital. A significant amount of work remains to be done if we are to achieve a gold standard of palliative care for the maximum number of patients who require it. There has to be a conversation between policymakers, health and social care professionals, service planners and communities, about what sort of care and support we want to give to people with terminal illness when their needs are becoming more complex, are often not being met and are likely to grow in number. At the outset, health and social care professionals should be prepared to speak openly and honestly to patients and their families and carers about the terminal nature of their illness and help them to plan their care pathway 
letting them know what services will be available to them and enabling them to make decisions which will help them as their condition progresses. Many health professionals and many families are uncomfortable about having conversations which acknowledge that death for their patient or relative is inevitable sooner rather than later. Although depending on the condition and treatment, terminally ill people may live for days, weeks, months or even years after the diagnosis is made. We need to try to change the culture in Scotland today and encourage more open discussion about death. People seem happy enough to make a will and there's a growing discussion about organ donation but there's still a barrier about acknowledging impending death. Professionals need to be given training and support to ensure that they're able to give high quality person focused care to people with terminal illness and better links need to be developed between generalists and specialists like cardiologists, neurologists and those who specialise in palliative care. And as integrated health and social care develops, the new integrated boards should be looking to have palliative care at the heart of their strategic plans because ineffective coordination of care between services such as health and social care or general and out of hours practice and between different organisations can lead to unnecessary delays in care and support. Despite shortcomings in gaining access to it, palliative care in Scotland is recognised as being of a high standard, but we do need to make more progress in achieving equitable access to good quality terminal care for all patients who require it. And Marie Curie have several suggestions for government which I will quote and which they think will move things forward. Firstly, that a reference to terminal illness, dying and death should be included in its planned revision of the 2020 vision document for Scotland. Also, that palliative care should be an early priority for integration, as I've just described. And that in the new strategic framework for action on palliative and end-of-life care, due to be published later on this year, there should be a clear commitment to ensure that everyone with a palliative care need has access to it by 2020, that robust data is collected to measure progress and the experience of patients and their families, that training and support is given to health and social care professionals to deliver effective care for people who are terminally ill, and that a clear resource commitment is made to achieve the aims and objectives of the strategy. Presiding officer, we live at a time when more and more people are living into healthy and active old age, thanks largely to modern developments in medical techniques and pharmaceutical products. But all of us are mortal. And sooner or later, many of us will require palliative and end-of-life care, some earlier in life following congenital or degenerative neurological or other conditions or malignancy, others much later from diseases I've already referred to. And I would like to think that we can, in the foreseeable future, achieve a high standard of such care for everyone who needs it, whatever their personal circumstances and wherever they live in Scotland. Not only is this desirable, it should also be cost effective, with the Nuffield Trust estimating potential savings of £500 per person by enabling people at the end of life to be cared for at home or in the community. Presiding officer, I look forward to the debate and to the Minister's response. And I hope everyone agrees that high quality, accessible palliative care is what we would all wish to achieve and what we should be striving for. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Patricia Ferguson to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And may I offer my congratulations to Nanette Milne for securing this debate this evening. Nanette Milne has outlined the work done by Marie Curie and the research undertaken on their behalf by LSE. The report changing the conversation demonstrates very ably the need that there is in Scotland to do exactly that, to change the conversation about death and dying and how we support those who are at that stage in their lives. And in previous debates recently on the uh, issue of Marie Curie, we talked in some length, some of us, about the fact that it isn't just cancer sufferers who are looked after by this charity, that there are a whole range of people who do benefit, but many, many more who could benefit. And Nanette Milne has comprehensively covered their arguments that we need to look at the care pathways available to people from the point of diagnosis. So I would like to concentrate my remarks on the carers, the people who support others through a terminal illness. Because caring for someone who's at the end of their life can be physically and emotionally draining, not least because the carer knows that their loved one is never going to get better. 
And many people who care for someone living with a terminal disease do not see themselves as a carer and therefore do not look for or even get the support and help that they actually need. The report Marie Curie commissioned from the LSE shows just how important carers are to people living with a terminal illness. The report highlights that people who don't have a live-in carer are less likely to report that they have sufficient help and support and also, and importantly, likely to have a worse perception of pain management and are far less likely to access community-based services. Now, all of these are serious deficiencies in the system. The LSE report also demonstrated that over 50% of people die in hospital, but that the vast majority of those would rather die at home. And the report suggests that having a carer was the single most important factor associated with home death, while living alone, conversely, increased the likelihood of a hospital death. Now, it's often difficult for people to navigate their way through the various layers of professional uh, and personal treatment and care that is involved in sometimes complex conditions. And it's often up to the carer to try to navigate through that uh, perilous journey. But carers themselves need support and they themselves are often anxious and stressed because not only do they have to watch their loved one going through a very difficult time, the most difficult time, but they may have given up work to look after someone. They may have had to reduce their household expenses in order to cope. They may find that they're having to pay more for bills as uh, looked after people very often need additional heating and additional supplies and special food. But they themselves can awfully, often be physically tired and emotionally drained because of the tasks they have to do. Carers put their own lives on hold and often neglect their own needs because of their dedication to their role. In some cases, they will still be trying to manage that role alongside the others that they fulfil in the family setting as mothers, as wives, as husbands, as fathers and as mothers, as well as perhaps trying to be the breadwinner if that's possible for them to continue to do. Now, importantly, Marie Curie doesn't think this is good enough and neither do I. Marie Curie argues that those caring for people with a terminal illness should automatically qualify for support and that this should be underpinned by legislation. They think that health boards and health professionals should ensure that carers are involved in discussions about the, the care of the person they are looking after. And in addition, Marie Curie believes that there needs to be more support for carers and that, crucially, this should be a consistent provision across Scotland. Presiding officer, Marie Curie are to be congratulated for many things, but this report comes at a very important time and I, for one, would very much like to thank them for identifying what needs to be done going forward as well as for all the things they have done for so many years. Many thanks. I now call on Roderick Campbell to be followed by Jim Hume. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. May I, first of all, thank uh, Nanette Milne for securing a debate on this subject and giving us the opportunity to, deport the, to, de to discuss this important matter in the Chamber. Uh, and may I also congratulate Marie Curie on the production of this important document. As changing the conversation makes clear, however, because life expectancy is improving, people with a terminal in in illness are living with more complex needs than before. It also makes clear that people in Scotland in the last six months of life spent anywhere between 10 and 22 days in hospital, despite the fact that most people want to, uh, to be cared for in their homes at the end of their life. Uh, at uh, a recent meeting of the cross-party group on dementia, we discussed end-of-life and palliative care, uh, and we were fortunate enough to have Richard Mead of Marie Curie and Amy Dalrymple of Alzheimer's Scotland as guest speakers to explain the work their organisations are doing around palliative care for people with dementia. In addition to this report, Marie Curie have recently produced a report, Living and Dying with Dementia in Scotland, which sets the scene as far as Scotland is concerned. We know that almost 90,000 people in Scotland are living with dementia, and this is set to double by 2031. 
Uh, close to 60% of people die in hospital, but as I said earlier, the vast majority of people would prefer to live at home. And by way of comparison, dementia sufferers in particular, a very small number of those uh, are receiving palliative care, whereas 75% of terminally ill cancer patients receive palliative care. When dementia sufferers do get palliative care, it's usually only within the last few weeks of their life. Yet as Marie Curie suggests, only 20% of, of, uh, of those who would benefit from um, palliative care who are dementia sufferers actually receive such uh, assistance. So why are people with dementia, and indeed others, not getting the care they need at the end of their life? Well, there are a variety of reasons. Um, location is certainly one of the factors. People in rural communities are clearly at a disadvantage, uh, and as indeed are those who live on their own. Uh, and uh, it's also clear that the NHS and voluntary providers have a limited capacity to deliver the necessary palliative care training and support to care homes. Care homes have a limited capacity to make staff available for training and to improve practice. And they're also hampered by the rapid turnover of staff, which is prevalent in many care homes, which makes it harder to embed and sustain the, this uh, uh, approach. So we have problems, but in relation to dementia in particular, as a terminal illness, we have to accept that there are implications on the type of care that is provided to those with dementia. Um, for many, they have little or no access to specialist care. If dementia is identified as a terminal diagnosis, we need to ensure that they are provided with the care and support they need uh, in the same way as any other terminal illness. Of course, there are also issues in identifying dementia as a cause of death on death certificates as the ultimate cause of death. Often uh, an infection or other co common illness is registered creating a culture where dementia is not recognised as a cause of death in its own right. So we must work to improve that. And I think that there has been some improvement, some increase in the prevalence of dementia on death certificates. And indeed, my own personal experience, my mother died last year. She had a variety of illnesses, but the, the, the cause of death was stated to be dementia. Uh, in addition, what can we, we do generally to help? tackle the situation. With an ageing population, it's vital that policymakers, health and social care professionals and charities work together to ensure that people with dementia in particular are receiving the appropriate care and fully supported at the end of their life. Uh, I would like to see that, that dementia, uh, end-of-life care in dementia in particular, is a core part of the National Dementia Strategy and uh, so that we can work towards the point where uh, people who might benefit from palliative care do indeed get that. We also need to focus on collecting appropriate data so that there's a clear natural, national, national picture of the level and quality of care being received. But there are some positives. More generally, we now have a new palliative, care, palliative and end-of-life care national advisory group set up at the end of last year. And, of course, the government has now published new guidance to support clinical and care staff who are planning and providing care during the last days of uh, life. So there are positives which hopefully that the Minister will comment on in his closing remarks. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I now call on Jim Hume to be followed by Michael McMahon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> I would like to start by, of course, congratulating Nanette Milner on securing this debate and pointing out the importance of the report by Marie Curie for the future of the health system as a whole. We have seen the numbers relating to palliative and community care and through them the underlying, underlying causes for the lack of equal and accessible care for everyone who needs it. This is why I want to confirm my support for the work of every person who is involved in making these services more accessible. Uh, I note the report's findings that tens of thousands of people are dying each year uh, without having been given palliative care and that more than half of those who pass away at hospitals had wanted to do uh, do so in the comfort of their homes. I found it disturbing that there are visible differences in the care that different groups of people receive based on their age or their ethnic or social background. While it's a promising indicator towards the goal of better health that advantages in technology, medicine and care help people live longer, but more people are developing multiple long-term conditions. The rising numbers of people living with multiple and complex conditions also means that the pressure is rising for hospitals, while at the same time we know, as said, that more than 50% of people want to be cared for at home towards the ends of their life. In fact, the report notes that investment in healthcare remains 
very much focused on acute services in a hospital environment and not on services in the community. There are unplanned hospital admissions that, of course, take up valuable bed days, while resources could be directed towards people's needs at home. Of these undesirable hospital bed days, people are losing between 10 to 22 days, as they could have been spending that time with their families during the last six months of their lives. As Marie Curley uh, rightly put it, the current situation is not fair. If we are to make palliative care more equally accessible to everyone who needs it, we have to ensure that inequalities that are to be uh, to the detriment of people receiving care are, of course, eliminated. No one should be denied care because of where they live or how old they are or their ethnic background. There's an opportunity to improve the situation uh, through the integration of health and social care, which, of course, will be implemented by early next year. Should resources be allocated appropriately and fairly, uh, and implementation, of course, involving all the relevant stakeholders, a lot of people will benefit through increased systemic support and care that treats each person with a terminal illness equally as important. There are other underlying problems that should also be discussed. Many people struggle, under understandably so, to come to terms with their conditions, uh, making them withdraw socially and often developing feelings of loneliness and depression. This is the last thing we want, of course, for people with terminal uh, diseases do not feel, uh, to not feel as equal members of society because of their illnesses and conditions. Tackling social isolation must be a top priority in terms of how care is provided. So we can have clear uninterrupted information and involvement, of course, of the care receiver, close family and their friends. Presiding officer, I've spoken about my support for the equal access to palliative care for everyone who needs it. I also want to point out our commitment for zero tolerance on any kind of inequality in receiving such care and our support for ensuring sufficient resources for the integration of health and social care in the community. I hope the discussion will uh, develop robustly and, of course, allow for a multitude of constructive opinions. And, of course, I would like to finish not just by thanking Annette, Annette Milne, but also Marie Curie for this report. And thank you. And I now call on Michael McMahon, after which we'll move the closing speech from the Minister. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. And can I join in with colleagues in congratulating Annette Milne for securing this evening's debate, but also thanking Marie Curie for producing the Changing the Conversation on Terminal Illness report, which I think is very timely and important. During the last Edinburgh Festival, I attended a number of diverse events, which were all very enjoyable for a range of reasons. However, the one that affected me most was a sort of variety show during which my emotions were pulled in all directions. It's the event which has stayed in my memory the most and will live with me for the longest time. It was an event which was effectively a showcase pulling together a few of the performers who were performing as part of what was called Death on the Fringe. That was a series of shows and events looking at death and dying and was essentially a festival within the festival. Some acts were serious, some were comical, but they all made you think about what it means to live well and die well. Death on the Fringe was part of the ongoing charity-led campaign Good Life, Good Death, Good Grief, which works to promote more openness about dying, death and bereavement. That campaign's aim is to make people aware of ways to live with death, dying and bereavement and help them feel better equipped to support each other through those difficult times. The specific event I attended was used to promote a further event which was held last November when Good Life, Good Death, Good Grief campaign initiated to Absent Friends, which is a people's celebration of storytelling and remembrance. This provided opportunities for people from across Scotland to remember and tell stories about dead loved ones. Good Life, Good Death, Good Grief are currently finalists in the Scottish Awards uh, the Scottish Charity Awards for this work and I wish them well because their campaign has certainly been one of huge significance as Scotland must break free from the cultural shackles which prevent people from talking about end of life issues and death itself. Death, dying and bereavement affects all of us yet talking about and planning for the experiences and practicalities associated with death, dying, uh, death, dying and bereavement can be very difficult. 
A few years ago, the cross-party group on palliative care had a presentation and discussion on the history of how we treat death in this country. And it was both fascinating and concerning to, to discover why we as a nation have developed such a dismal, morose and cheerless attitude towards this subject. We have also seen in the cross-party group um, experiences from palliative care experts who have gone to Africa and seen how the attitude towards death and dying in countries uh, in that continent contrasts so starkly with the manner in which we debate the subject. So we need to become more open about death, dying and bereavement because it is holding us back and it is impacting on adversely on how we deliver health services. Because GPs find it difficult to discuss death and dying with patients, and because patients find it uncomfortable to discuss how they might die, we create an environment in which we curtail an understanding around terms such as palliative and hospice, and erect barriers which prevent people from obtaining effective services and support. Marie Curie are therefore correct when they say that everything, everyone living with a terminal illness should have access to high quality care and support which meets their needs. We have to break down the barriers which prevent that from happening. So to get to that point, we need to transform the conversations about terminal illness so that people can have the best possible quality of life and death, regardless of their circumstances. It should not be those with the loudest voices and the sharpest elbows who get access to the services which people need, especially those from the most deprived communities. So we have to make people more comfortable using words such as death, dead and dying, and enable them to make choices relating to their own death and dying. Health and social care professionals and volunteers in all care settings must be made able to have discussions relating to death, dying and bereavement with patients and their families. We often hear about the importance of starting early with our young people on reading and writing and the environment and other issues, but we must also ensure that children grow up treating dying as an inevitable part of ordinary life. Palliative care is often ignored or at best tagged on to far too many of our health strategies. We have to make it available, accessible and appropriate and central to meeting the multiple needs of each individual person requiring additional care to live well. Marie Curie's report emphasises yet again why we need to make that so and it is very, very welcome for having done that. Thank you. Thank you. And we now move to closing speech from the Minister. Minister, seven minutes or thereby. Thank you, uh, President Robson. Can I begin by thanking Annette Milne for uh, securing this debate? What is a, a sensitive but very important uh, subject? And can I can also thank Marie Curie for all the work uh, they undertake across the uh, communities of Scotland. Uh, the report by Marie Curie published last month, uh, changing the conversation, is uh, very helpful. This report, along with the Marie Curie Commission London School of Economics report uh, that has been referred to, uh, both uh, helpfully emphasise uh, the importance of creating the conditions where conversations about all of these pressing issues leads uh, to action, action that will make clear the essential priorities for the future coordination, planning and delivery of high quality palliative and end of care, uh, care for everyone uh, who need this. Uh, these are issues that must be considered for everyone, including uh, people living with a wide range of uh, conditions, well as children, young people and their families who are also sadly affected by conditions where cure is not possible. Our commitment uh, in Scotland to a new strategic framework for action was made in recognition of this need for a nationally agreed set of actions that will deliver the changes organisations such as Marie Curie and others have rightly highlighted as being uh, urgently required equity of uh, access to palliative and end-of-life care services, uh, irrespective of where you live or what clinical condition you have, it will be a central element of uh, the framework. We have uh, established a new national advisory structure, refreshed stakeholder engagement arrangements and detailed plans to support our commitment to publish a strategic framework for action towards the end of this year. The Structures now in place uh, provide more effective links with GPs, hospice chief executives, nurses, palliative care specialists and the leadership of NHS boards, local authorities and national scrutiny and improvement organisations. We will achieve uh, improvement by working with people, encouraging participation to make sure that everyone feels they can work together towards a common aim and aim uh, that will see palliative care available to everyone at the earliest possible opportunity. The uh, legislative changes that we have introduced with regards to the integration of health and social care set uh, in place a new framework for how services are, are organised. Jim Hume rightly uh, spoke of the opportunity to improve through the integration process. And of course, integrated joint boards uh, will now be responsible for commissioning a uh, palliative care 
services in hospitals and uh, communities, uh, ensuring the combined resources from health and social care are targeted through a strategic commissioning. We will uh, expect the new integrated joint boards to take account of all of uh, the issues raised by organisations such as Marie Curie and ensure uh, that uh, their strategic commissioning plans describe how resources, skills and services will be able to demonstrate and describe how everyone who needs palliative care gets this, no matter if where they live or what condition they are living with. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, 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 integration is uh, part of the integration process. The third sector are, have an important uh, role. Rod Campbell spoke about the role of the third sector. He mentioned Alzheimer's uh, Scotland uh, in particular. And I think it was, of course, important to uh, remind ourselves that dementia is uh, a terminal uh, illness. And in that regard, I can say there are around uh, 1,500 NHS, uh, NHS paid for dementia continuing care or dementia specialist beds in Scotland, providing some of the most complex, uh, intensive and challenging care for people in advanced uh, stages of uh, their uh, dementia. But uh, in regards to Alzheimer's Scotland, which uh, was mentioned, uh, who were mentioned by Rod Campbell, officials, Scot Scottish Government officials recently met with Alzheimer's Scotland to ensure that the work they are uh, doing on a service model for dementia care at the end of life informs uh, our strategic framework for action that I referred to uh, earlier. Uh, in taking forward the, uh, our uh, work in relation to palliative care, the Scottish Government fully uh, recognise that we need to address the taboo that exists in Scotland around discussing death and that is something that Michael McMahon uh, spoke about in his uh, contribution. We are supportive of good work like the Scottish Partnership for Palliative Care, Good Life, Good Death, Good Grief Alliance that Mr McMahon uh, mentioned that is being uh, undertaken around uh, people being able to uh, talk about death uh, and dealing with uh, related uh, issues and in relation to the point by, uh, made by Mr McMahon about, uh, and others indeed about uh, doctors being able to feel confident about discussing uh, death. The Scottish Government is uh, working closely with the General Medical Council in Scotland to support doctors who often report a need for advice uh, on uh, having uh, uh, the confidence to have an open conversation with uh, their patients around uh, such matters. The establishment of a communication coalition is also uh, being considered. This is in response to growing calls uh, from key stakeholders to have a more visible strategic commitment and support more dialogue regarding care preferences when cure is not possible. We need to be uh, bold if we want to create the conditions for people to feel able to broach these issues and to move away from medicalisation of some aspects of palliative and end-of-life care. People know what matters most to them and need to be supported to talk to doctors and nurses and care staff about this. Talking about preferences for care and being more open when uh, time is becoming short often leads to a much better quality of life, relief that difficult conversations uh, no longer need to be feared or avoided. And we know that most people want to uh, plan care which supports them to be at home with their families at the end of their lives. That's why anticipatory care planning is now central to health and care in Scotland. A cross-sector group has been established with representation from health, social care, housing, third and independent sector and service users to help embed anticipatory care planning in every locality and enable people uh, to think ahead and to record uh, their wishes. More people need to be supported to have uh, their care plans in uh, place. And Patricia Ferguson, in that regard, talking about people being uh, supported at home, rightly uh, highlighted the important role uh, of carers uh, of those with a terminal illness. I should uh, say, of course, the Scottish Government published new uh, guidance uh, to support clinical and care staff for planning and providing care during the last days and hours of life at the end of uh, last year. And one of the uh, key four principles that was identified is that consideration is given to the well-being of relative or carers uh, attending the person. Of course, we have a uh, public care of Scotland bill uh, which will ensure better and more consistent support for carers and young carers so that they can continue uh, that caring uh, role. Uh, Mary Curie have rightly emphasised the importance of being able to have uh, data and information to be able to describe progress and they are particularly interested in the voices survey used in England. Our future plans therefore must include the enhancement of a national approach to measurement and monitoring. This includes a key indicator on end of life care as part of the requirements to measure improvements in health and wellbeing outcomes under health and social care integration. These uh, indicators will of course need to be tested over time and evolve to reflect the changing needs of individuals and so I will ask uh, Scottish Government officials to ensure that we also encourage the local use of voices survey questions to support improvement and provide data at a national level to inform future strategy and policy development. The aim is that there is a good quality anticipatory care plan in place for those who need it and we will consider if there are, are any additional uh, qualitative and quantitative measures required on which we can build and improve. And in addition, the uh, Scottish Government has been working in partnership with the NHS, COSLA and the third sector to develop a new framework to effectively listen and respond to the voice of those who use health and social care services over time as it is implemented. This 
a stronger voice uh, initiative will provide an increasingly robust framework in Scotland for continuing dialogue with people on what they want from health and social care services. So I hope that gives an indication uh, President Officer, of the great importance that this government uh, places in ways to uh, supporting those who uh, are at the end of uh, life and what is always a difficult circumstance for them and uh, their families. But of course, we'll always be very willing to consider what more we can do. Many thanks. And that concludes today's business. And I now close this meeting of Parliament.